Hi everyone, um, hopefully you can see me. Um, hello and welcome to this event on race consciousness and the law. Um, I am Leela, I'm a policy officer at the Howard League where I lead the race and youth justice work and I will be chairing the discussion this evening. Um, a little bit about us while we're waiting for more people to join the virtual space. Um, the Howard League for Penal Reform is a charity working for less crime, safer communities and fewer people in prison. We pursue these goals through research, campaigning and legal work and with the support of our members. Our aim is to find and promote solutions that help people unlock their potential, deliver better justice and prevent people becoming victims of crime. And just a reminder that, as I said, we are a membership organization and we value membership from everywhere. Um, so if you are interested in becoming a member, the link should be in the chat box. And a little bit quickly about the work we're doing, which this report connects to. Um, so it's a three year funded project funded by the Esme Fairburn Foundation, um, which looks at racial disparities in youth justice and addressing the rising numbers of black, brown and racialized children in custody. Within this, we will be focusing on remand and joint enterprise. And if you'd like to hear more about this work, please feel free to email me and I'll put my email address in the chat box as well. So moving on to this evening, um, this event focuses on new research published by the Howard League, undertaken by Dr. Alexandra Cox, that explores the experiences and insights of defense practitioners in relation to racial disparities that exist at all levels of the criminal justice system. It shows how lawyers who are present at almost every stage of this criminal justice system are in a unique position to identify and challenge racism, but that their knowledge and experience has been under-researched. Moreover, it argues that the widespread adherence by the legal system to the notion that the law should be colorblind and race neutral is a barrier to challenging and eradicating harmful racist practices. So in light of this, the aim of this evening is to share lawyers' insights into the challenges that both they and their clients face in the criminal justice system, and to discuss strategies that aim to address and ultimately to dismantle racist and classist legal practices. And joining us, we have three wonderful speakers who I'll introduce briefly. Um, firstly, Dr. Alexandra Cox from the University of Essex. Dr. Alexandra is currently senior lecturer in the Department of Sociology at the University of Essex. She has previously worked at the State University of New York in the fields of criminal justice and drug policy reform at the American Civil Liberties Union, the Drug Policy Alliance's Office of Legal Affairs in California, and then at the Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem in New York City. She has continued to practice as a sentencing mitigation specialist, representing primarily young people charged as adults. And in 2017, she was a research fellow at Yale Law School, working on a study about the role of frontline workers in New York's criminal justice system. And joining her, we have Lorianne Power Casey from 25 Bedford Row, Barristers Chambers. Appointed Silk in 2022, Lorianne has acted on cases of varying size and complexity, including murder, kidnap, firearm offenses, sexual offenses, complex fraud, and associated offenses, including hidden asset recovery and confiscation. She is ranked as a leader in crime in the Legal 500 and Chambers UK, and was awarded BSN Lawyer of the Year at the UK Diversity Legal Awards in 2019. And we also have Sandra Paul from Kingsley Napley LLP. Sandra Paul is a partner at the law firm Kingsley Napley and a member of the Youth Justice Legal Center Advisory Board. Her practice spans the full range of criminal litigation, but the majority of her work concerns defending allegations of sexual misconduct. Sandra chaired Justice's Working Party, Tackling Racial Injustice, Children and the Youth Justice System, and also co-authors the biannual Police Station Update for Legal Action Group and Defending Suspects at the Police Station, the Police Station Handbook. So I think it's fair to say we have three very impressive speakers with us tonight. Um, and just before I hand over to Alex to present her work, I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping and talk through the format of this evening. Um, so firstly, the event is going to be recorded and will be sent to everyone that RSVP'd um, to it and will be open to all um, to watch. Secondly, on the chat box, unfortunately, we can't see you all. So please do use the chat box if you'd like to say hello and please feel free to use it to share thoughts or links to helpful materials or your organizations or just to introduce yourself and say where you're from and why you're interested in being here tonight. And quickly on the format. So we're first, as I said, going to go to Alex to speak a little bit about her report and speak to the research that she's done. Um, and then we'll move to a discussion of the report and its findings. And this is going to run in the following way. So we have a list of set questions. And with each question, I will first pose it to the panelists. 
who will have the opportunity to respond and discuss. Then I will open up discussion to the audience um, and please put any thoughts or questions in the Q&A box and I will field them to our panelists or alternatively you can raise your hand and we can unmute you. If you see any questions or comments that you like, feel free to upvote them in the Q&A box. A little bit of community is always nice in these online spaces. We will follow this process for every question and we should have time at the end of the session for final reflections. And the reason we're sort of structuring it with this like question by question approach is to provide ample opportunity for you to share your thoughts on the report and its implications, which we hope will make for a richer, more participatory discussion. If there are no questions or concerns at this stage, I will hand over to Dr. Alexandra Cox to present her incredible research on race consciousness and the law. Great, thank you so much, Leela. And, and I also wanted to just thank the Howard League for hosting this event, but also pulling together this really important project. Um, and I especially wanted to thank Anita Dockley, who who really helped to lead on this and on this research, and also Laura James and Ife Thompson from um, who, who from Black, Black Protest Legal Support. So I think is also um, potentially here today uh, for doing really important work on creating an anti-racist lawyering guide um, that really set this research into motion. So thank you. And also I really wanted to thank Lorianne and Sandra for being here because their work is really at the front lines. They were participants in this project and, and I think inspired me to, to think um, quite deeply about this issue. I also wanna thank the members of the focus groups who um, some of whom I think are here tonight for participating in these really rich conversations. Um, I came to this work myself from doing criminal defense social work and, and, and legal defense work in the US. And from doing that work, I know that lawyers working at the front line of criminal defense are in a really unique position because they're both sort of at the front lines of the system, but also they often serve as lightning rods um, for some of the harms that their clients confront every day in the courts. And, and I think we will touch on some of the ways that that impacts on them personally, but also on their capacities to do the work. So thank you all again. I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, this project uh, just to sort of start us out. And, and I hope that those of you who are here who got uh, access to the report will take some time to look at it. It's a short report with the aim of really being accessible to, to members of the public and, and those of you who are legal practitioners. Um, and it's, it's a report which I hope will um, be a start of a conversation and will complement existing strategies. So the report's based on focus groups that we conducted with 30 lawyers who were practicing in England and Wales. Um, and the focus groups included uh, a mix of um, solicitors and barristers, as well as other uh, participants from across the legal system, um, including one person from the Crown Prosecution Service, but it was largely focused on criminal defense practitioners. The sample was roughly, um, uh, you know, slightly overrepresentative in terms of women working in the system, um, and I think it's really helpful to have um, Sandra and Laurie Ann here, who, who I think can also speak about kind of the importance of thinking intersectionally and, and how race, gender, and class kind of come together in the practitioner experience. And finally, we overrepresented in our sample um, for practitioners who are from Black, Asian, and ethnic minority backgrounds, in part because the focus of the project was primarily on anti-Black racism. And we were really interested to know not only about the experience of practitioners, but also practitioners representing um, clients of color. And, you know, this is an overrepresentation in part because sort of in terms of the broader population, only 17% of solicitors come from Black, Asian, and ethnic minority backgrounds, and 14% of barristers come from those backgrounds. So um, you can see that our sample um, is slightly different kind of group of individuals. So the aims of the focus groups were sort of threefold. I mean, I think one of the key aims was to complement our existing strategy um, in building a, pra a practitioner's guide for thinking about anti-racist practice. So we wanted to inform that guide. And in doing so, we wanted to kind of understand where the gaps in knowledge existed for practitioners who were interested in engaging in anti-racist practice. But we also wanted to kind of think about some key areas where um, 
practitioners could make a contribution to kind of not only improving client outcomes, but also um, client engagement. And then also identifying the key barriers to anti-racist practice, which I think I'll highlight here today, um, which were very, <laughs> there were a lot of barriers that, that and challenges that do exist. Um, I'm just highlighting a few of them today, but I think you'll see in some of the themes that emerge that practitioners do the best that they can to sort of work within an existing system structure that can be quite challenging at times. So three of the themes I wanted to highlight related to aspects of the report that um, related to not only kind of broader system engagement, but also um, the kind of um, ability of practitioners to operate within that system and, and use um, tools to kind of exercise change in that system. So the first challenge is relates to the experience of existing in a system and working within a system that presents itself as ostensibly race neutral or colorblind. Um, the second uh, finding uh, was really about how practitioners grappled with and confronted the experiences of working with individuals who themselves had experienced accumulated systemic harms, um, and particularly in terms of facing racism, but also as practitioners themselves who faced um, racialized harms throughout their lives and how they worked within those systems. And then finally, um, another key finding was related to the uses of experts in the courts and um, the kinds of evidence that are used in the courts to um, perpetuate often racialized stereotypes and myths. So in terms of the kind of issues of color, colorblind um, racism, the lawyers talked quite a bit about um, the ways that efforts to be race conscious in their practice and sort of highlight um, issues of racism in their, in their practice were often stymied by pressures in the courts and even the police station to be race neutral. So I'm using pseudonyms here for the um, lawyers in, in these interviews, but um, this is um, a quote from Anya, who was a, a barrister uh, working the system, who I think really nicely captures some of the ways that lawyers seek to use strategies in the courts to kind of talk about racism, but aren't necessarily able to explicitly name racism. So she says that one of the really difficult things is that we do it by sleight of hands. So you make all these arguments. You can never address the elephant in the room head on. You never say to the judge, what you have in front of you is a young black man who appears to be sentenced. And you must recognize that and take that into account and not allow that to influence your judgment. I don't, I would never dare say that to a judge. Instead, you say things like, take into account your socioeconomic background. So Anya is one of a few lawyers who spoke about the reliance on things like sort of um, what she calls sleight of hands to talk about racism, um, instead of directly being able to confront issues of racism in the courts. Solicitors also equally found um, that they struggled to address issues of racism in the police station. So Amy spoke about um, this experience of um, what she says, stepping into the police station and automatically being put into a corner. She says, it's the way that the police react to you. Because as soon as you start using those words, for example, this is a BAME child, look at what you're doing, this is an appropriate behavior, it puts their back straight up and you're put in a corner. So these were just a couple examples of some of the challenges that, that lawyers articulated about facing this kind of system which demanded that they not name issues of racism um, explicitly. Some of the other challenges that lawyers faced were in kind of confronting the difficulties of unpicking some of the sort of systemic harms that their clients faced. Um, and in particular, sort of managing that relationship, not only in the police station, but in the courts, um, particularly when in some cases, the kind of practices of the courts amplified those experiences. So for example, here, um, lawyer talks about how um, it's, kind of like an accumulation of, um, like being treated as a threat and a racialized threat over the course of one's experience throughout the institutions. And then you sort of get to this place in the courtroom where it's kind of the one, one of the endpoints of that long point, you know, that long treatment of being treated as a racialized threat. 
Finally, I wanted to focus on um, some of the ways that lawyers really highlighted some of the limitations of evidence um, in the courts, and in particular, the kind of use not only of experts or so-called experts, particularly on gangs um, and, and the uses of drill music and rap music in the courts, who um, drew from the police force and how police uh, officers effectively had become gang experts, but also the difficulty in identifying experts who were really available to kind of challenge um, racialized myths and stereotypes. And I think even on this uh, call, we have um, Ethna Quinn, who's a wonderful scholar based at Manchester, who's done some really important work in challenging some of those myths. But we really, you know, continue to need more people like Ethna who, who are available to kind of point to the racialized realities of clients' lives and also the uses, of, the harmful uses of, of evidence, particularly, for example, drill, music, and so on in their lives. So um, Walter, who's a barrister, spoke about this problematic use of police experts. He said, as far as experts are concerned, it's pretty easy these days to become an expert, especially if you're a police officer, because after you've been working at a, as a local community officer and have gathered sufficient information about what's happening in your local area, and then being called on a number of cases, it's very easy to create your own CV. If I can put it that way, to place yourself in a position whereby other officers can then rely upon you as being an expert. So I just highlighted a few kind of key quotes from this report, and I hope that you'll have a chance to read it and, and hear and read yourselves the sort of narratives of some of these lawyers that we interviewed because they're so rich and interesting and varied. Um, and, and I'm so grateful again to have a conversation today um, with Sandra and Lorianne and, and, and look forward to our discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alexandra, um, for what I think we can all agree was such an interesting presentation. And we were actually just discussing before this event how great it is to see what is often represented as empirical data or kind of numerical evidence um, in this like rich narrative form, because it really sort of tells the story in a way that um, is much more emotional and real, I think, um, sort of. So I think now we're going to start with some of the questions. Um, if that's okay, Lorianne and Sandra, if you could turn on your cameras, that would be great. Thanks so much. Um, so the first question, which is also kind of an invitation to respond to the presentation Alexandra just gave is, why do you think that the lawyer's voice is so underrepresented in research into the criminal justice system? And subsequently, why is it important for this research to be undertaken? <laughs> you can comment on that, okay. sorry. <laughs> I mean, I think that the work that needs to be done in relation to research into the criminal justice system has really only just begun. I think that we have a significant shortfall of research into different aspects of the criminal justice system. And I think it's only now in, in more recent years that the narrative has opened up about as to why it is that for many, many years, decades, we have lived within a criminal justice system that is racist, structurally racist, that we all know that it's structurally racist, but that we've all been complicit in our silence within that. And that's not to blame anyone. Um, but, but now I think, I think probably as a consequence of the Black Lives Matter movement, people have felt more um, confident to be open about what they deem to be the issues within the criminal justice system. So I think then we people now have a voice. And I think that now that people feel free not to be um, shouted at and you know, accused of being oversensitive every time they raise an issue, we are now hearing very slowly, but steadily people, not just black people, but people of all ethnicities and both genders coming forward in the criminal justice system and saying and identify that this is this is what's happening this is wrong and this this is how we suggest it, it might be remedied um i think that part of the problem has been that when you live and work within the criminal justice system there is this code of silence where you don't speak about um what's going on inside the courtroom you don't speak about what's going on inside the robing room and really the police station is a really a law unto itself so there's this code <laughs> this code of silence where um, you, you can almost be outcast if you're the person 
who is brave enough to step forward and speak up. And I think that that's been the problem that many lawyers have had over the years. It's not because they haven't recognized that there is a problem, but it take, it's such a traumatic process for people of color, but in particular black people, to actually get their foot across the threshold of the criminal justice system, working in the criminal justice You often don't want to do anything to upset the apple cart. And so you kind of live and you kind of move along with it. And before you know it, months turns into years and years turns into decades. And, and here we are having the conversation, perhaps for the first time openly, where people can feel free to openly say, we live and work and operate within a justice system that is systematically, systemically racist. And we are going to fix it. And so I think the lawyer's voice is being uncovered. It hadn't been uncovered before now because of all of the barriers that exist, which keep racism um, going, but we're dismantling it bit by bit with reports such as this, a brilliant report, if I may say, Alexandra, which really gives a narrative that we all know exists, but a narrative that we can read and use it to complement the data, the, the real staggering statistics about the disparities that exist from defendants to lawyers, to silks, to judges, every single step of the way in our justice system, people of color, but in particular black people are discriminated against, underrepresented and overrepresented in places where they shouldn't be. And so the voice I think has been silenced now for all of those factors, but um, we'll be silenced no more, Sandra. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I completely agree with you. And the other thing for me was this great comfort. It's like, I'm not going mad. It's mm. not just me. It's not just the people I know. Because, you know, you kind of hang with people who think and, and, and are approaching things in the same way that you are. But actually, this is much wider. It's not me that's going mad. It's the system that's broken. And I think if I add to that, Lorianne, that part of the reason why um, I think we haven't had this before, absolutely the reasons you raised, but also because it's an extra job. So for those practitioners who are interested in this in the first place, in addition to what you've got to do for your day job, doing things like this, finding opportunities like this, making use of opportunities like this, um, are, it's another thing that you have to do on top of the extra work that's involved in doing your day job in a way that seeks to combat the systemic racism in the system. So you, you have lots to do. You made it really easy, Alexandra and the Howard League. Thank you very much. Well, I, I only just wanted to add that, like, I mean, this is so interesting to hear and, and thank you both again, but it, it's interesting to hear from your perspective, because I think from my perspective, even just doing research is that I think there's often a default in the, in the system to sort of think, okay, well, we need to interview, um, you know, people, police officers or probation officers, or, you know, in terms of frontline workers, or we need to interview um, people who are accused of crimes who are going through the system. And we often don't understand that defense attorneys themselves manage through like an incredibly complicated set of roles in the system that um, I think maybe by default we think, okay, well, maybe it's not, you know, they, they may, we assume that all defense attorneys may have the same perspective or similar perspectives. But I think what I learned from these conversations is that the perspectives are really rich and, and varied. And, mm -hmm. and also this is a group who, you know, obviously is, as you said, Sandra, very busy and, you know, overstretched. But I think, you know, there are often, it's not often, they're not often asked their opinions about what their own perspectives are in the system, because they're so often fighting for other people or, you know, stretched thin and in, in these parts of the system where they're called upon. So I, I think sometimes it's also a plea to say, like, this is a really rich, you know, your community of people who really have varied perspectives and struggle through these questions in difficult ways. Um, and, and there isn't just a kind of, you know, set view and about how, how people experience the system too. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that, I think we have to be careful with, um, placing the responsibility for change on those people who are most significantly damaged by the system. And I think what often happens, I know certainly within the system that, that I operate on a daily basis, I can't let it slide. <laughs> and, and so uh, the trauma that I brought with me to this profession, and that's the trauma of growing up 
in a working class council estate, being excluded from school a number of times, having to fight through every single day, a system of education that was broken, that didn't expect anything of me. You get through that and then you step into a justice system and you see the same behaviors, the same behaviors, the same attitudes, the same marginalization, the same discrimination. And what it is, it's, it's triggering. And, and so through all of that, what we have to do is we have to represent our clients to the best of our ability. Fearlessly, we can't allow that to impact on us. But at the same time, we've got to call it out. And at the same time, it becomes our responsibility to call it out. And therefore the burden, the extra burden, as Sandra's saying, is placed on us having another job of trying to fix a system or certainly participate in fixing a system that's broken. But many, many people who work within the system and are users of the system, whether they're defendants, are broken by the system that exists outside of the criminal justice system. The criminal justice system is a very small facet of a wider society of discrimination and marginalization. From the NHS, if you're a black woman, you're more likely to die in childbirth. If you're a black child, you're more, more likely to get kicked out of school. If you're a black person, you're more likely to get stopped by the police. It, and it goes on and it goes on and goes on. If you're in Sainsbury's, you're most likely, more likely to be followed around the store. And so it goes on and goes on. And so then we come and all we want to do is do the lawyering. We want to represent people to the best of our ability. But before we get to that, we have to unpick the structural racism that our, our clients are facing. And that can be very emotionally draining. And I think that we have to be careful with all of these reports and these pieces of research, really important for change. And I have to say, I have seen a number of judges and members of the judiciary, as well as other lawyers of non um, black and minority ethnic backgrounds, really, really for the first time, just being really encouraged and willing to do anything to try and make a change. And I think we have to be careful that we again are not left with the burden, the responsibility of change. It's got to be a holistic root and branch change from the bottom to the top. Sorry, I did say, I told you I was a chatty patty, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that was great. <laughs> I was just waiting to see if anyone else wanted to come in, but I think we might have a hand raised, if not. Um, and before we go to that hand, um, someone has commented in the Q&A box to say, I fully agree with Laurianne that it cannot and should not be down, be just down to black lawyers to challenge racism. Um, so after that, could we now go to the raised hand, if that's okay, Katie? And the hands, oh, yep, it's back up, so. Oh, I can't see it now, but if you raise your hand, um, feel free to raise again and we can allow you to talk. Has the hand been unraised? Yeah. So, Jude, um, I'm going to, oh, it's gone again. <laughs> Here we go. You should be able to talk now, Jude, if you unmute yourself. Hi, sorry. That was, it's a bit confusing whether the lower hand or raised hand is up or down. Anyway, hi, Sandra and Laurieanne. Hi, Jude. Hi, Jude. I love hi, Jude. that comment, um, but then I press send by mistake. So, um, yeah. I think it is down to everybody to challenge racism and to really do something positive within the criminal, I'm going to call it criminal legal system as opposed to criminal justice system because I think it's a misnomer. Um, I was at a conference, no, not a conference. I was at a, I don't know what to call it, a meeting last week um, with a large number of community groups specifically around race and the criminal legal system and the civil legal system and really quite a large amount of what we talked about was to do with lawyers and the lack of trust um, by many black people that find themselves within the system in lawyers so that was one point but also the um, issue of lawyers not wanting to raise the issue of racism and um that first comment by um that the barrister about oh i would never raise that in front of a judge or i'd be scared to do that i'm afraid i think that sums it all up um to cut to the point we 
we felt very strongly that lawyers need proper anti-racism training mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. for them to actually understand what it means in a practical sense to challenge racism and to raise racism within the criminal legal system, within a trial process, within a sentencing process. And we came up with quite a lot of practical ideas about what we could do. So I just wanted to ask both of you whether you what you thought of training, um, and I mean it in the widest sense of the word, and whether you thought that that um, would be something that would take matters forward in terms of lawyers actually raising issues properly. Shall I go? Uh, I, I completely agree with you, uh, Jude. I find it astonishing that my regulator is interested in lots of things I do, but not whether I've done any training in this area, you know, that I can continue to practice without anybody checking whether I've done that or not. Um, and, you know, the reality is if you don't kind of measure it, people won't do it. And, and it seems to me that there are so many resources, there are so many people who are offering good training, good information, opportunities to share what works, what doesn't work, um, that there can be really few excuses or real reasons um, beyond the, the atmosphere that's created in the court or the police station as to why you don't. There are just like lots of different ways to do it. If you just use the statistics and draw the statistics to the attention of the court and say to the court, look, you know, even if I haven't got the specific information from this yes. child, because, you know, when you're asking someone to say, you know, tell me how racism affects you, it's like saying, tell me how you breathe. What do you actually physically do? It's part of your DNA. So actually describing it sometimes is quite difficult when we're taking instructions from our clients. But do we have to prove that it happened for this child or is it enough to say to the court, here are the statistics. We know that they're true because they're the MOJ's own figures. Um, you, you have to consider whether this is a possibility for this child. The fact that you cannot discount it means that you have to take it into account as a factor that may be relevant to this particular outcome. And I'm, that's what I'm asking you to do because we can't ignore the, the statistics that are right in front of us. The judge can read it just as well as you can. You know, so I think that the kind of sharing the information and um, ideas and guidance about how we do that is really, really important. I just don't get why my regulator's not interested in why I know this stuff or not. I mean, I think, can I, I just add to that? You know, you've got, you have two different types of discrimination. You've got the, uh, the overt discrimination, which is uh, far easier to call out. And in fact, having statistics and guidance where, you are as part of your duty, duty bound to draw these factors to the court. I mean, it's your job, it's your responsibility to do that. And the training, in order for training to work, it has to be coupled with accountability. So the training has to be compulsory, first of all. There can be no opt-out, it must be compulsory. And this is where our regulators, I know are doing lots of work, the bar council, the bar standing board from a barrister's perspective, I know are doing lots of work to try and implement these kind of almost compulsory type of training courses, but accountability, because of course anyone can do a course, whether or not you go on to implement the recommendations of the course it, it is another thing. So that, that, that I think goes some way to addressing the more overt types of racism that exists within our system, the difficult racism that we have to uh, contend with is the more insidious type of racism, the, the covert racism that is unidentifiable by a person, that is unidentifiable by a comment or a statistic, but one that operates at such a granular level that, that it is the, the, the the single mechanism that keeps all of the other forms of discrimination going. It's things like looking around a courtroom and seeing that the only black people in the courtroom are the people in the dock, including the jailers. Maybe yeah. you might see a member of court staff, but that everyone else in the court system, often including the jury, are white. And, and so, that's not reflective a, of the society in which we live, but it also means that the environment that we work within is one in which these stereotypes and these narratives can persist. But how do you call that out? Mm -hmm. What do you say? 
without sounding as though you're just completely crazy. And so that change has to come from a far deeper level. It's got to come with recruitment. It's got to come with fair access. It's got to come with education. This is a whole root and branch approach. So yes, barristers need to call out, solicitors need to call out, those people who need to call out, but that is just one very small part. And in fact, most people are not so stupid as to say or do anything so clearly racist that it, the need to call it out is there. It's the more insidious type of racism that is the difficult part for us. And so I think, yeah, I think I, I agree with you, Jude. I think our responsibility is there, but I think that um, it's a far more complex structure that we have to dismantle. Absolutely. Sorry, Jude, were you about to come back on that? I, I Sorry, didn't... I was just saying that, that um, yeah, I mean, I completely agree with, with both of what Sandra and Lorianne have said. I would be interested to know whether, um, Lorianne, you think that it is worth um, training. <laughs> I, I agree, it's extremely complex, but I suppose that um, sometimes what, what you're trying to do is find practical ways of dealing with the situation in the most immediate position that we're in at the moment. So while we are not going to be able to immediately dismantle the whole of the entire system, which is actually what needs to be done, but that might be able to find some ways of making a difference in individual sentencing trials, um, I, I think you I think training is absolute robust training is absolutely essential. Yeah, I completely agree at all levels. I'm just going to come in here on this because I think that takes us quite nicely on to the second question. Um, and I know there are still lots of questions in the Q&A boxes um, and I've heard there's some hands up as well, but hopefully we can come to those at the end or further on through the discussion um, if it's still appropriate. Um, and kind of moving on to this notion of sort of practical implementation and strategy. In the report, Alexandra talks a lot about kind of race conscious versus race neutral approaches. Um, and I was wondering what the three of you thought about um, potential strategies for deploying those race conscious approaches, how we do that, what exists, what can be done. Um, and yeah, I guess just to make more concrete these abstract structures um, and in so doing make concrete the weapons we have to fight them with, if that makes sense. I'll defer to my colleagues here first, and then I can sort of weigh in on some of the broader messages we got from the report. Sorry, did you say you're going to go first, Alex, Alexandra? Sorry. No, I'll defer to both of you first, and then I can I can share some of the broader stuff. Well, I think I mean race neutral. I just I know these people come up with these phrases, and I just have to shake my head sometimes. You know. We are trying to deal with a system that is, by its own admission, racist. So there is no neutrality here. I do, one day we would like to get to a position where we walk into an environment in the criminal justice system where race doesn't play a part, um, a negative part. But, you know, we often see race as a negative, you know, we're proud to be black people. <laughs> we should be able to use and stand on our race as a positive. So for example, it's always the negative connotations to do with black and minority ethnic people within the criminal justice systems that, that are used. And so I think that um, we have to be conscious of race for two reasons, because of the positive, rich cultural differences we bring to the criminal justice system as practitioners. Every study ever done has determined that every system, whether it's a commercial financial institution or a criminal justice system operates better where there is a mixed diverse array of people who work within it. And so I think we have to be conscious of that, first of all. We also have to be conscious of the issues that come, the negative issues and connotations that come with being people who, black people, people, brown people who operate within that system. So I think race consciousness is important and, and I think it should long shall it last. Race neutrality, I, I have to say as a concept, I don't really 
gets. And I think that it's a, it's, I think it's a distraction from the real issue. And I think that one day we all live in utopia somewhere and black isn't white and white isn't black and we're all deemed to be the same, but then great. But at the moment, I don't want to be race neutral. I want to be a black woman. <laughs> I don't want to be anything other than that. And I don't want to have to shy away from that. So I don't want race neutrality. And so I think we just have to be careful that we don't get into this environment where we're trying to counsel out anything that's different because anything that's different is deemed to be bad. I'm sorry, I don't know if I answered the question, but that's just my take on it. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, but we didn't discuss this, but that's why you notice I didn't say anything. <laughs> I, I'm... I, I struggle with with this one a bit um and I I don't know how I don't know how I feel about it is the wrong word but how I respond to it um what I want is for you know I I think that the system no matter what system we've got it's it, and and I'm I, I definitely don't advocate different rules policy you know dif different laws or, 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 you know, some other consideration for dealing with black and brown people. You know, I, I don't want that because I think that that is very dangerous. What I want is an obligation on the court or the decision maker to consider a number of issues. The first of which is this person's age, their gender and their race. You can put it whichever order you want. But I want the judge to have to deal with it. And I want to be able to see in the reasons where they have dealt with it. When the police are looking at bail, I want them to have to articulate what they have taken into account in respect of those issues so that I have a chance to interrogate it. So I don't know whether that is conscious or neutral, or, but I just want to be able to to interrogate it and hold people to account in terms of the decision making. I don't know if that's a, a, a good... I mean, that makes so much sense. And I think I mean, there are existing tools within the system and certainly there should be more tools. So for example, the sentencing guidelines have warning labels about disproportionate sentencing of black people for certain offenses. And, and you know, it's arguably legal, legal practitioners should feel empowered to use those tools. But I agree that I think one of the things that came out for me in this report was that the lawyers really wanted to be able to name the precise sort of systemic injustices. And, and you're right to name sort of gender, race, class, age as important categories and be able to name and lift those experiences as shaping their clients' lives in front of the courts in really explicit ways. And I think just to speak to what Laurie said, I mean, this means having difficult conversations. This means naming racism rather than using words like it or, you know, what's going on. Um, and I think that that was that really came out for me. I mean, I think the other thing I would just add in terms of practical steps that really, really sort of struck home was the need to really broaden the set of experts that lawyers draw upon mm -hmm. to challenge racialized um, narratives, particularly around gangs, particularly around um, sort of in joint enterprise cases. And I think, you know, one of the things that the lawyers really sp spoke about was the deep reliance on police officers and the kind of failure to challenge police officers as experts. And I think the responsibility on defense attorneys and, you know, indeed, prosecutors to really not make assumptions that um, these so-called experts really, um, you know, are able to speak to the realities of, of, you know, really what, what is at stake here for so many people's lives who, who fall on these um, cases. So I think also developing a stronger cohort of experts, but also not being afraid to challenge evidence um, that's being used. So being really more vigorous about challenging really weak or limited claims about gang association and so on, just as one example. Yeah, I mean, I think this is where I struggle, you know, the most perhaps in terms of the, the evidence or the, the way that admissible evidence is being broadened to include uh, so-called expertise of people who use music as a medicine. You know, many of these young children, often young boys, grow within a culture where music is their lifeline. Now, it might not be the kind of music that you or I listen to, but the genre of music often reflects 
the society of the communities in which they live. It doesn't mean that every young boy who writes straw lyrics is a gangbanger. In fact, there is the tiniest proportion of young black boys who go through a phase of writing drill lyrics, often between about the ages of 13 and 15, who quickly kind of make the transitions through it, who don't get involved in the criminal justice system at any time, at any point. And often we see a young person's fate sometimes balance on a lyric that they wrote in their bedroom when they were feeling pretty shit about their lot in life. And that the only way that they could um, medicate themselves, uh, give themselves therapy, was to listen to this music because it's the era that they're raised in. Had it been 20 years old in Harlem, it would have been hip hop. I mean, you know, we happen to be London, where the genre of music is grime and it's drill. The content of the music is violent, but again, that's no different than content of, you know, whether it's heavy metal, bring your daughter to the slaughter, death left. You know, I can name any genre of music that talks about, you know, violating women, being violent to their opposition. It, you know, the behavior that we see played out on social media is far broader than what we see played out in these drill lip groups. And there's also this, society, has commercialized this music. And so the companies that promote this music make billions from drill, billions from drill. It's every store you go into, every radio station you play, they bleat out the expletives, but the music is the same nonetheless. And so it's important as lawyers, our responsibility is to drive that narrative through to the jury. And the jury system is the best system in the world. Juries get it, but you've got to make the effort to challenge it, to drive that narrative, to provide them with the evidence that shows if you turn on Capital Radio 1 at any time of the day or night, you're likely to hear Diggity, who undoubtedly was part of the gang's matrix. And yet we then criminalize these young boys for listening to said music that these companies are making billions from. And if you drive that narrative and challenge these experts, um, because you know they are experts, you know whether we like it or not, they are experts, they're officers of the court, and so they're accountable. And so it's better to see it as they're not being experts. So you're an expert, and so I would challenge you in the same way I would a pathologist, in the same way I would a forensic scientist, in the same way I would a cell site expert. If you claim to be an expert in drill music, as a practitioner, you better go away and do your research about drill music because you need to be cross-examining this expert on every single piece of evidence that they purport to demonstrate that your client is part of that gang's matrix. And I think one of the people that interviewed in your in Alexandra in the research said that time and time again, they just see this evidence being allowed to go in. Now, it might be strategically, there is a case where it's in your interest to have it, and I don't know, you know, I'm not criticizing every person who doesn't challenge it. It might be that the evidence is overwhelming and that it's really little point, but I don't think as a matter of course, we should allow this evidence to be deemed as acceptable because once we do that, juries accept it on face values as what it is. But the moment you challenge, juries are brilliant. They are fantastic at seeing things for what they really are. So I agree, I think, I, I think we do need to be more robust and challenging um, and not allowing the parameters of admissible evidence, which is potentially discriminatory to, to, to effectively fill the course as a matter of course. I'm just gonna come in here and move us on to the next question because we are already crazily running low on time. Um, and this kind of builds, Lauriane, on what you just said in terms of thinking about drill, as both the concern for the clients who are in an environment where drill is a lot of their maybe cultural context and for the lawyer in understanding what drill is in order to kind of effectively advocate for said client. Um, and in the report, Alexandra, there's a, someone you quote who says, the trauma wasn't just for the people I was representing, it was for me too. And I, I kind of wanted to ask all three of you, I suppose, about this in a bit more detail. Um, I think that you know, there's an extent to which both BME lawyers or, or black, brown and racialized lawyers and black, brown and racialized clients 
are racialized in the same way. Um, but on the other hand, there is a maybe class distinction or a distinction in the fact that one group of people are lawyers and the other are defendants in a criminal trial. Um, and I was wondering what role you think race and class play in those distinctions and similarities that you might have with your clients in terms of building empathy or other sorts of solidarities, I suppose, um, and whether you could speak to that slightly. Um, you know, so as someone who grew up working class and and in the community who looks very much like a lot of the clients. I mean, you know, I see clients now from a, a wider range um, of um, classes and, and circumstances than, um, than I grew up in. The reality is that it's still the same. When you see that person at the police station, you think about why they're there. You, I don't just think of that person who's there. I think of people I know. I think of people in my family. I, I think of the people who I went to school with and you see them there and you, not, it's, I can't say that I know, but I always suspect that there is some nefarious thing going on, that some additional factor that is relevant to them being there. And that is difficult. And, I, and sometimes, you know, not so much I have to check myself, but keep it in line in terms of not making presumptions about things. But I kind of walk into it going, I know there's something fishy here. Um, there is some additional issue which has to do with why this person is here, why it was that they couldn't uh, deal with this other than an arrest why it is um, that they are talking now about bail conditions or how it is that they've made that assessment. It's, it's kind of part of representing black and brown children. It comes with the territory. Um, I don't know if, um, I think there have been occasions where I've been in the police station and I have felt that the police have treated me differently to the way that they would treat somebody else. Um, and, you know, there is no getting away from the fact that, you know, some of those clients might be looking at me going, what can you do to help me? <laughs> You're in the same situation that I am in terms of helplessness in this situation, in, in this system. So, you know, does it affect me? Yes, it does. Um, but I think that the thing to do is to channel those experiences, use those experiences. Um, I don't want anybody who is not black or brown to feel like they cannot do this but I, I do begin a conversation with that familiarity into like I don't know you I don't know your story but I can anticipate some of the challenges that you have had and that is a good basis to start a conversation um I don't know if other people would agree that that's the right thing to do or wrong thing to do. But, you know, again, you know, Laurieann, you were talking about using it as a positive thing. I've, I've got to. I've got to use what I've got. Um, and it is that it does help in terms of building that relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't want to exclude anybody, but it does help. Yeah, I, I mean, look, I, have, I, I completely agree with Sandra. I, I mean, I think look, I have seen in the past 20 plus years in this job, I have seen um, white barristers and white solicitors from privileged backgrounds mm -hmm. do jaw-droppingly brilliant work and provide representation that I could only ever dream to provide. And it, it, it more often than not, barristers want to do a good job. They don't want to be distracted by race, white barristers don't want to be distracted by race. Um, many recognize that race is a fundamental issue within the criminal justice process. And most, most of them that I see, especially dealing with cases such as murder, you know, such as very serious criminal offenses, the level and standard of representation I find exceptional, I have to say. Um, as a black woman, especially now as a black woman in silk, at the cold face, at the forefront. <laughs> hands up, bring your hands up. I'm joking, sorry. Um, I find myself being called auntie quite a lot. So, <laughs> or miss. Now in the, at the Old Bailey, I've been going to the Old Bailey for 20 years, right? So now I'm there as a silk or whatever. So one of the things I think that traumatizes me most about this job is standing in the cells of the Old Bailey and seeing 
young black boy after young black boy after young black boy pass. And for me, it just is very traumatic. And the way that I think as a black person, you can connect to another black person, first of all, is by virtue of your blackness. Now, it doesn't mean to say that because we are black, you know, I may be West Indian, you may be of African descent, I may be from North London, you might be from East London, we may have, but we have that in common. And I think that most of us who work in the justice system are able to make that initial connection, that saying, I see you, I hear you, I will always say, make sure you behave yourself. And if I've got a client who's there, I always make sure I touch their hand, I hold them and I say to them, listen, you know, we've got to work together here. You break down that. And more often than not, I know that they find some comfort in the fact that I am a black woman, mostly because they're boys, probably because I look like their mum or their auntie, sometimes probably even their grandmother. But they have that. Most of the time, there will be a point in that trial where my client will fall to his knees and cry and be upset and it will all come down. Now, I'm not saying that they wouldn't do that in front of a middle class white male, but the likelihood is that being able to empathize with them on that level of familiarity and visibility, it might, it might just be something additional that they can draw comfort from. That is why, as John I've said, visibility to me is the most critical part of change People who work within and use the justice system have to see people who look like them. They have to. And not just at the back of the court in the dock. It's got to be from the bench all the way down at every level. And so I think visibility is important. And so I think that defendants and their families and victims and their families, whether you have a black prosecutor prosecuting someone who has killed your child, you might just draw some comfort in that. And in a word, I have to say that the reverse is also true. We are all, as black practitioners, often faced with those defendants who don't want to be represented by a black person because they feel that actually a jury might not take them as seriously as they take a white person. So there is the flip side to that. Alexander, fact, yes, to... in fact, that was um, a comment, Lorianne, that came up several times in the focus groups, your last comment, and I think was really astonishing. I mean, you both captured so well, like the, this, like the, the kind of ways that you've reflected so much on your practice. I mean, I think the only thing I would add, and I say this as a sociologist, is that I think one thing I observed in doing this work was that you have these enormous resource challenges as demonstrated through the strikes recently. And, you know, the kind of challenges that you're facing and ways that you're stretched thin that, um, you know, relates in part to the kind of deep underfunding of legal aid. And one of the things I observed was that like it means that the space for reflective practice and for conversations like this becomes narrower and narrower or is very narrow. And I think the kind of reflections that you're engaging in and, and, and which I've seen others engage in about the work seem very critical for making sense of like what, what as Laurie Jo, you're saying is like incredibly difficult and sometimes, as you said, triggering work. And I, I think what I've observed is just lawyers who are under deep strain and stress and don't have the space or the capacity or the time to be making sense of these experiences collectively and with each other. And that that that's very difficult because it, you know, at least in the conversations I heard, there was like so much rich conversation and people had so much to say and offer, but it was, um, yeah, it's just, it just seems that it's, they're very narrow opportunities for doing that. And, and that's troubling because um, it seems such a critical part of the work too. Yeah, just I mean, to I quickly think... come in, sorry, I think we have a hand raised. So could we go to the hand first and then maybe in responding to the hand, Lorianne, you could also respond to what Alexandra's just said. Casey, if that's okay. Hi, Lorianne and Sandra, it's Farat here. Uh... <laughs> I'm really enjoying your talk. Um, and I just wanted to join in with, with the last um, conversation. And I think it does make an absolute difference that where people of colour, whether we're being barristers or, or solicitors or sitting as judges, actually, and that's, it, as you know, I very recently started being a recorder, and it was really interesting because I literally, the first trial I did, it was a, a mixed race guide. He wasn't very old. He's probably about 21. And his dad came and sat in the back of court. And he's a black guy. And he literally did a double take when he saw me. <laughs> and it was really funny because, you know, it was, in a, it was in a really white area. He wasn't expecting that. The jury were all white. 
but he looked at me and I, maybe I was making it up, but I like to think that he took some comfort from the fact that there was a woman of colour, or you know, up there. And he, I'm not joking about the double take. And I sort of was trying to somehow I was trying to convey to him, "Don't worry, it's all right. You're gonna, your son is gonna get a fair trial." And he did get a fair trial, and you know, the marvelous white jury acquitted him. So all, all was well. But it was really interesting. And that's when you sort of notice that it makes a difference that we're in these positions. I mean, we kind of know it, otherwise we wouldn't be doing the jobs we're doing. But you also need to tell yourself that. And any of the people who are much younger listening. You've got to tell yourselves that, that it absolutely matters that we get to these positions because it, you know, it makes a material difference. The difficulty is the cost. And you've touched on the cost because if you're part, you know, if you've been a victim of systemic and institutional racism, which quite frankly, if you're a person of colour in Britain, you know, you have, um, you, you then have what Sandra was calling, you know, you get the triggers and all the rest of it. And on top of that, the difficulty with the, with, having an additional burden I suppose is until conversations like this it's not called out you don't mm. know it's going on you don't know why you're more stressed everybody gets stressed at work so you don't know that you're more stressed than others because you have this additional layer of having to deal with being a person of colour in a white system and that's why these conversations I think are extremely important so that anyone feeling that level of stress can say actually it's because I I have a more difficult I'm having a more difficult time and I, I'll call it out. I, I do think you are having a more difficult time if you're a minority in, in any system, even, you know, as a professional. And the way you get through it is you have to have conversations like this and you also have to have allies. And we've talked about allies before, how important allies are so you can carry on doing the job. The other thing is, again, you know, and I, I do hope this doesn't sound patronising, but people shouldn't feel like they've got to rush in and, and, and call things out and have this conversation at an early stage in their career. Because you know what? It's Sometimes it takes time. You have to get to a level where you feel confident in both how you do your job, but also to speak out. You know, good for those people who can do it when they're, they're young. And we can all do it to an extent when we're young, but to do it properly and to be able to stand up to judges and things like that, you actually have to get to a certain level of seniority to, to have the confidence to do it. So I don't think people should necessarily feel like they've got to do it straight away and they're not, you know, they're, they're part of the problem if they're not doing it. I don't think that's the case um, at all. And just lastly, I will stop talking. Um, the subconscious bias thing is really interesting because again, when you get behind the sort of wizard's curtain and you see, like when you're in a position of slight power, I'm not gonna overdo it, but you know, you get behind the curtain and you see what goes on and it almost straight away I got, you know, someone saying, a judge saying something to me, I'm going to remain nameless, not about me, but about somebody else. And as he was talking, and it, it wasn't, it was all, I think it was subconscious bias, actually. And I remember thinking, I bet he's talking about someone black. And lo and behold, he was. And colour was never mentioned, but it was what he was saying. I thought, mm. I bet she's back. And she was. And I thought, the next time I see him, do I call him out on it? Or do I just... Do I let it go? And I'm still grappling with that one because, you know, obviously I haven't seen it again since, but it was so interesting that you see it in action when you're behind the curtain, you see how subconscious bias happens or you yeah. see it, you know, playing out. And that, I think, again, you, we will, you know, you do call it out and we have to call it out. Um, but it's, uh, it, yeah, it's an interesting journey, put it that way. But that's all I wanted to say. So I hope that was of some use to, to somebody. Thank you. Can I just come in on what Farrat, just on one thing that Farrat said about complaints, because I think it's so important. And I think that she's right, you know, when you're a very young uh, practitioner, whether it's a solicitor or a barrister, um, it's a fine balancing act, isn't it? You're often quite afraid to, to call something out because it takes years of confidence and building. And I think that it's our responsibility as those who work within the profession to provide a platform upon which those people who don't want to or aren't yet at a stage where they feel that they can say directly to a person or directly to a judge or directly to their opponent that they believe that this is happening but where they can still go through a complaints procedure or they can go to someone in their chambers who can take it up on their behalf or someone and you know we often do it in our chambers if someone feels as though something's happened and there's been uh, you know you go to a senior person in chambers and they can pick up the phone to the judge and say look you know and so I think that um, yes, there will be people who don't want to complain because of the sensitivity that comes with it. But I think that there are mechanisms that we can put in place. And this comes to, you know, solutions where people who don't feel able to directly at the stage that they're at, call it out, can still 
be a part of trying to remedy the process by going to a complaints procedure where they can. And then those complaints procedures should be published. And so, yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. Did Sandra or Alexandra, either of you want to come back on the question or the comment that was just made, or should we move on? Happy to move on. I was so enthralled by the conversation. <laughs> I've clean forgot what the question was anyway. I know. I was just thinking the same, but unfortunately to everyone attending, we have about, if my math is right, um, seven or eight minutes left. So I'm going to move us on to the next question and then and then hopefully we can wrap up with some last comments from well, three of you and last comments and reflections from participants. Um, but it sort of links to what you just spoke to, Lorianne, about solutions. Um, and I wanted to ask all of you, I suppose, what you think you see as examples of good practice that are happening now in relation to challenging racism, both against the legal profession and against clients within the criminal justice system. And, you know, subsequently from that, where do you think we can go from here? Um, and then my favorite question, which is, what does an anti-racist justice system look like? Which is quite a hard one. So maybe we can pass <laughs> that right till the end, but just one to, to bear in mind for the participants as well. Um, so maybe Sandra, if you start first and then Lorianne, if that's okay. Um, and so say the question again, please. Sorry. So the question is, what do you see as examples of good practice in relation okay. to the issues discussed and where can we go from here? So I think one of the most important things, and I know it sounds really boring, is you need to know the law. You need to know the guidance. You know, so somebody who is kind of intensely aware is all over that stuff and does that before you go to the police station, before you pick up the brief. I think that those people who are taking the time to kind of, it, 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 you know, understand, to learn, to get information, to, to form connections, those people produce the best practice. I think that being an anti-racist lawyer isn't something you can just say, well, I'm going to do it today. It's an ongoing process in terms of you having those skills, those connections, that knowledge, that commitment. Um, I think that um, I really like the increase in um, availability of statistics. I know that they're boring, but they give us the basis on which to make um, informed comments and judgments about what we see going on in front of us. So I like that. I think it would it needs more granularity um, in some areas, but you are seeing those stats um, broken down in terms of ethnicity, broken down um, in terms of age a lot better. Um, I think as well the increase in and you know, I'm the last person necessarily to support the police, but there are an increasing number of APPs, approved professional practice. There are high ranking officers who are being ascribed to these areas that are important to us, whether it's in terms of children, in terms of race. And I like seeing those things. They make my life easier because when I see something, I know who to go and speak to. I know who to try and contact regarding a particular issue um, that has come up. Um, I think that individuals are working harder at this. I think that um, if I look at um, other lawyers, they are seeing this as a central part of what they do. I don't know if you want me to be more granular in terms of practice, but I think that that kind of general uh, move towards this being OK to do, this being OK to talk about, and not just OK, but an essential part of what I do. My downside to doing that is that we are remunerated in the majority of our profession is remunerated in a way that reflects the value that's placed on us. We, uh, we get no money. And what we're effectively saying is to represent this black brown child well, you've got more work to do but you're not getting paid any more money. I'm not saying, please do not anybody misunderstand me as saying that I think that you should get paid more for representing black and brown children. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is it's more than a coincidence that we have this over-representation of black and brown children in the uh, people in the youth justice system um, and the criminal justice system rather. But this the way in which we are remunerated has continued to be battered. There is a relationship between those two things, mm -hmm. in my view. Mm -hmm. So some of the other things that I like then are when you had like the working party with a review regarding legal aid, and it was saying, actually you need to pay people who do this work 
better than you do now. So there are there are a whole bunch of different things that are happening at the moment that I like that didn't happen 20 years ago when I started doing this. Um, I, 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 I don't know, Laurieann, what do you think? I, I completely agree with everything Sandra said. I have to say, you know, on a, on a, on a positive note, um, you know, we've both been in the justice system, criminal justice system for, for many years, probably decades. Um, and, and this is the first time that I can say that I have truly seen some positive movement. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's slow and it's painful. But you asked, uh, John, um, sorry, uh, Lely asked what progress looks like. This is progress. Mm -hmm. Being able to sit, uh, us four women together, sharing in a conversation with people who are interested in this topic openly without fear that is progress that wouldn't have happened even five years ago probably you know David Lammy's review was in September of 2017 we've heard nothing silence nothing implemented now we have a, a bright robust quite radical group of young lawyers coming through who are unwilling to go through what we went through and, and I think that they are certainly the key to a lot of change. And so I think progress comes in many forms. I think three, the three things I think I would say very briefly is in, we have to accept that institutional racism within our justice system ex exists. The biggest barrier to change come from those people who are unwilling to accept that there is a problem. And you would be astonished by the amount of intelligent people that I work with on a daily basis who refuse to accept that there is a problem simply because they do not consider themselves to be racist or their friends racist or anyone else in chambers racist or the clerks racist or and the list goes on and goes on but there's a problem somewhere you know so acceptance of the problem is the first thing second thing is robust meaningful training for all of us including black people <laughs> Um, who have to learn how to deal with the trauma and to educate because we have now been placed in the position of being educators for change as well and then finally I'd say there needs to be accountability and the chambers that have implemented those three things and there are a handful of them matrix being the first um, I know 18 but there's a number of chambers that have accepted that there is a problem that have implemented or certainly taken steps to implementing properly quality training and then holding themselves to account each year by continuing to review the changes and the progress that's being made in terms of recruitment, diversity, challenges, so on. Those are the ones that we see the most progress in. So I think those are just three areas where we can make some real change. Mm -hmm. I mean, conscious of time, because I know it's ending, I think these were brilliant ideas. I think I'll, I'll wear my hat as um, like Leela mentioned, I'm a sentencing mitigation specialist, so I work on criminal defense cases in, in, in the US. And I think in that role, one of the things that I've seen in amongst kind of in legal practice and that I've observed here is that sometimes I think criminality is confused with criminalization. And I think we don't do enough to talk about the experiences of criminalization that our clients have, have experienced. I think that in efforts to sort of present mitigation, we often focus on sort of you know, why and how the clients have begun to commit crimes, but we don't always acknowledge that they've been in systems that have also, and institutions that have also harmed them. And I think we don't do a good enough job of, of bringing what is now like really robust evidence about how practices of criminalization like really can be harmful in people's lives and, and, and really shape their lives. And I think that's just a sort of pitch for saying like, not to neglect in, you know, there's sometimes we, separate out you know these practices where we're talking about lawyering from actually like the advocacy that's happening in the courts where we fall back on easy narratives about like why our clients started committing crimes and so on without you know observing some of the systems that they've been through thank you so much alexandra and thank you very much to laurianne and sandra um for making the time today of what has been a, such an incredible rich inspiring conversation um and like you said Lorianne, I don't know how many years ago this kind of conversation would have been possible um so feel very lucky to share the space with the three of you um thank you so much for attending if you're a participant and you're still in the audience um the link to become a member of the Howard League if this event has interested you in that should be in the chat um 
I can't seem to pop my own email in the chat, but if you do for some reason want to reach me, my email address is on our website and will be in a follow-up email tomorrow, which all of you should receive. Um, thank you again for taking the time out of your day to be here um, and have a lovely week. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.